Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at Proverbs chapter 30 in our continuing study of the book of Proverbs. We've come a long way, chapters 1 through 29, and most of that was the one-verse maxims between chapter 10 and chapter 29. Uh, But now we've finished that section. There there were Proverbs of Solomon and then Proverbs collected by the men of Hezekiah, also of Solomon. But now we have some larger couplets in this chapter, and these are going to be described as the words of Agur. So the words of Agur, the son of Yake, the oracle, the man declares to Ithiel, to Ithiel and Ukal. Uh, Now, this is the superscription. We're used to seeing superscriptions in the Psalms, um, and we've seen a few here already. Remember, chapter 10 started off, these are the Proverbs of Solomon. Uh, And then we had in chapter 25, these are the Proverbs of Solomon that were collected by the men of Hezekiah. But now we have a new name, the words of Agur, the son of Yake. Um, Now, some of the Jewish uh, scribes and rabbis used to think that perhaps this is just another name for Solomon. I think what happened is they didn't like the idea that there were Proverbs in the book of Proverbs that were not written by Solomon. They didn't like the idea of multiple authorship. Uh, And so they were looking perhaps for some explanation, uh, and they came up with this. They said, well, uh, Agur is just uh, the idea. It's another term for Solomon, and Yake is just uh, uh, actually... Uh, an anagram. It's the letters that make up uh, Yahweh, or so they said. Uh, I don't think it really works. Um, And so that was their explanation. Um, I think it's a poor explanation. I think this is just uh, another selection of wise sayings. And notice he's called an oracle. Uh, So he's going to be speaking the words of God, and we find out uh, in verse 2, he says, Surely I am more stupid than any man, and I do not have the understanding of a man. Neither have I learned wisdom, nor do I have the knowledge of the Holy One. So he starts off giving a disclaimer. He says, look, it's not that I'm so bright. I'm not like Solomon. I'm not the wisest man that ever lived. Uh, (laughs) He's the polar opposite. More stupid than any man. uh, Doesn't have the understanding of a man. Hasn't learned wisdom. Nor does he have knowledge of the Holy One. And yet, because he's an oracle, he's going to be speaking wisdom. You see, when he's speaking with God, there's going to be wisdom here, but if it was just if he was just on his own without God, there's not a whole lot there. Uh, it's not that he's smart; it's that God makes him smart as he speaks the words of God in this oracle. So he now now goes to ask five rhetorical questions. Uh, we start first question: Who has ascended into heaven? and descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Who has wrapped the the waters in his garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name or his son's name? And of course, the answer isn't Agur. It's not that he's so smart. It's really, this is pointing to God. And notice his name, but also his son's name. Surely you know. Verse 5, every word of God is tested. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. And then there's going to be a warning. Do not add to his words or he'll reprove you and you'll be proved a liar. So listen to God. It's from God that the oracle is speaking. Every word of God is tested. Now when it says uh, every word of God, uh, ka uh, amra, that's uh, all words or every word. And then instead of Elohim, it's Eloha. Um, which is sort of a singular for Elohim. Uh, it's the same, same God, but it, instead of Elohim, the actual word is singular. And, and we've talked maybe in another class about how the plurality there is. It, I don't think it's talking about the Trinity. By the way, I am Trinitarian, but I don't think that's what it's, it's talking about. I think it's speaking of uh, God as the majestic one, the, the, what we call the plural of majesty. Um, but here, that's not what's in view here. So uh, here's a not that common of a, a term. It's not. This isn't the only time it's found in the Old Testament, but it's it's used a few times. Uh, every word of God is tested, uh, but notice that word for word, uh, am, amra, or imra, actually, in, here in the Hebrew. Um, and that's because we're going to see that term there, and then we see in verse 6, do not add to his, but here when we read about his words, it's a different word, his uh, davarin. Um, that's... Um, I'd probably translate that second one, words, or things that you say. Uh, and then, uh, well, you say, what's the difference between that? Um, this, uh, let me try it this way. Every saying of God is tested, and then don't add to his words. It's, it means the same thing. 
Um, they're synonyms, but a different word is used. Uh, and I think perhaps the idea there is just like the sort of poetry we're used to saying. You say it, and then you say it again, but a different way, with different words. Now, that first verse, verse 5, we've actually seen that verse elsewhere in the Old Testament. It's a direct quote from David's song in 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 31. Uh, so here that's being echoed. Now, it could be that somebody just said, uh, it happened to say it, the same words, and, and it's not actually a quote, but, but that's, quite, uh, that's quite a bit to, to not have it be a direct quote. So I, th- I think that perhaps Agur is actually quoting from David as he says this. And that would probably play into, into those who think maybe this is a, a, uh, another name for Solomon. But I don't think that's necessary. I think that somebody else that probably had either uh, heard David's song or maybe read it in the scriptures. But don't add to his words or he will reprove you and you will be proved a liar. So, Agur speaks as an oracle, and yet he tells us in verse 2, he doesn't know anything on on his own. It's not that he's so smart, but rather he can speak rightly from God's word. And isn't that true of us as well? Um, Even though uh, we might not be so brilliant or so smart, in fact, I think of 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 1 and verse 26 that talks about how there were not many uh, mighty and not many wise chosen, but God has chosen the foolish. Uh, and, and he chooses us to do that, especially if we will speak rightly from his word. Now we have a prayer. Uh, Agra's prayer is going to start off in verse 7. This is the only prayer in the entire book of Proverbs. And so let's look at it. Uh, two things I asked of you, do not refuse me before I die. And now he's going to, the the first thing, verse 8, keep deception and lies far from me. And then number two, give me neither poverty nor riches. And then part of that, because it it is two things, um, feed me with the food that is my portion. So notice, don't give me poverty. Uh, nor riches, those are sort of polar opposites. Um, you know, oftentimes people that uh, are saying, well, Lord, I don't want to be poor, but being rich would be okay. That'd be cool. Uh, somebody said uh, that, that money doesn't buy happiness, but it lets you be miserable in comfort. Uh, but notice he says, don't give me poverty or riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion. And now he explains that in verse 9, that I not be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? That's if I have riches. Or that I not be in want and steal, that's if I have poverty, and profane the name of my God. It reminds me a little bit of that parable that Jesus told, the parable of the sower. You remember that? Where uh, there's the, the seed that is dropped on the, uh, on the hard ground and it never really develops anything. But there's two other seeds before you get to the good ground. There's one where the seed drops on the thorns and it raises up really quick and the thorns choke it. And Jesus says later on, he says that represents uh, the good things that can happen that actually uh, do uh, what we see here that it's, you're full and you deny uh, God and you say, who's the Lord? Where you are distracted by the pleasures of this life. Or, conversely, the seed that drops on the stony ground, and again, it begins to grow up, but the stones actually uh, hinder it from, from really getting good root. And that's the difficult time. So you, you have the, the problem of the good times, but also the problem of the difficult times that, again, drive away those spiritual concerns. And that's what's being pictured here in this proverb. We come next to verse 10. Do not slander a slave to his master, or he will curse you, and you will be found guilty. Uh, Now notice, there's three people involved in this situation. There's you, and then there's the master, and there is his slave. So it's saying, do not slander a slave, so don't give slander. Of course, you're not giving the slander to the slave. You're giving the slander about the slave to his master. So you're slander. You're giving slander uh, to the master about his slave, or he will curse you. And to whom is he cursing you? He's cursing you to God. God is the one who hears the curse, and you will be found guilty. You see, the point here is that you also have a master. <laughs> and so, uh, you slandering the slave to his master, he might, and it's not slander, he'll curse you, uh, because it's not slander, because you did something wrong. And you see, slandering is the idea where you're saying something that's untrue about that person. 
Uh, and so don't you be doing that. Uh, notice what this is a call uh, is speaking to the issue of social injustice in the area of slavery. It's not just saying, oh, well, slavery is wrong, you know, get rid of slavery. No, slavery was a thing back then. Uh, let me just say, uh, employ employers today are a thing. That's how one of the ways we can apply this passage. So you could say instead of slaves, you could talk about employers and employees, and, and the principle, I think, would still be there. And so this is dealing with social injustice, but very particularly social injustice in speech, because that theme is going to continue into the next proverb. So now we have a, another proverb, beginning in verse 11. There is a kind of man who curses his father and does not bless his mother. Now, that kind of man, that's actually speaking to the fifth commandment, you know, that says, honor your father and mother. Uh, so here's a person who's doing the polar opposite. And then we read in verse 12, and notice that's something that you say in, in, in cursing and not blessing. And then verse 12, there is a kind who is pure in his own eyes, yet is not washed from his filthiness. So you have two bad situations. One, social injustice in speech, the, the person who curses his father and mother, and this arrogant, self-righteous person who he thinks he's he thinks he's pure, he thinks he's right, and yet he's filthy and and what's more, he's unwashed because you don't wash if you if you know you're you're wrong, if you know you're dirty, you go wash. But if you don't know, you just remain in your filthiness. And that's the kind of person that's being described here. Next, and we're continuing with social injustice in speech, there is a kind, oh, how lofty are his eyes, and his eyelids are raised in arrogance. Uh, notice that uh, um, the, the phrase in arrogance is actually added by the translators, but that's appropriate when you say his eyelids are raised. That's a figure of speech. You know, you look at somebody who raises their eyes, you know, and, um, in other words, they're, they're looking down at everything else. Um, there is a kind of man whose teeth are like swords, and his jaw teeth like knives, to devour the afflicted from the earth, and the needy, oh, remember the needy? We talked about that, the, the afflicted and the needy. Remember the slave that was, that was being um, spoken of, that was being slandered? Uh, here we are again. Notice how these are all connected. So this is like the man who slanders a helpless slave who, who does this sort of thing. Verse 15, new proverb, a new section, uh, the leech. Now, I'm not fond of leeches. Uh, this is uh, an animal. Sometimes they're in the, they're in the water, uh, I guess in, in uh, the wild, where it can sort of attach itself to you, sort of like a ugly looking worm sort of thing. And it begins to actually, it, it penetrates your skin and begins to suck your blood. <laughs> uh, leeches were not considered to be a good thing. It's sort of uh, gross, and and it's, it's supposed to carry that idea here. The leech has two daughters. Give, give. Um, so notice the leech has two daughters. Oh, there's, there are those bloodsuckers that always want more. And then we have uh, three things that will not be satisfied. But notice it's three, but then there's four, actually. So three things that will not be satisfied, four that will not say, enough. And here they are. Here's the four things that uh, they just seem to want more. Sheol, that is the grave. Now think about that. Everybody dies, so the grave always wants more. Um, you know, that's just the, the natural facts of life. Uh, and the barren womb, you know, if it stops being barren, then, then it's not a barren womb anymore. But there's, there's a desire there. Uh, so Sheol and the barren woman, earth that is never satisfied with water. There's certain kinds of ground where you pour it into the ground and it just soaks it up and it, it, it's just dry all the time. Uh, let me just say, people who live in the desert know all about that. And then finally, fire that never says enough. Now, back in my younger years, I was a firefighter, did that for 30 years. Um, and uh, I have never seen the fire that was burning and it got halfway through consuming, what, you know, whether it was uh, sticks or gasoline or whatever was on fire, it got halfway through and said, oh, I'm done. I can, I can put myself out now. No, it always wants to consume all the fuel. That's the very nature of fire. And so there are things that just won't back down, that won't quit. And notice how these three and four are related to the first one. You know, uh, there's that which just doesn't want to quit, that doesn't know when to stop. Next, verse 17, the eye that mocks a father 
and scorns the mother. Here's the fifth commandment. Again, we already saw that. Uh, Notice this eye. The ravens of the valley will pick it out, and the young eagles will eat it. Here, the, the point here is this eye. Uh, and so this is going to introduce a new section of things that you see. Um, and notice in this case that they come to a bad end. You know, uh, that, it, that eye is going to be picked out and, and eaten by uh, vultures, you know, young eagles, that sort of idea. Next, you come to verse 18, still on things you see. There are three things which are too wonderful for me, four which I do not understand. Now, three, then four, that's sort of a you know, uh, an ancient way of describing is really talking about four, but uh, you're leading up to it. And that's uh, a little bit of a way of telling you, watch out for the fourth thing, because that might be where the significance is going to be seen. So you have these four things. First of all, the way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a serpent on a rock, the way of a ship in the middle of the sea, and the way of a man but notice what I did is I circled the word instead of the man, uh, the maid, the way of a man with a maid. Now, we look at that. What do those four things have in common? Well, one of the things you look at it and you say, well, gee, uh, what makes it go? <laughs> you know, the way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a serpent on a rock, the way of a ship in the middle of the sea, uh, the way of a man with a maid. You know, I guess you could ask that thing. But when we come to the second one, and I think they are related, Because verse 20, uh, this is the way of an adulterous woman. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I have done no wrong. When we look at this proverb and ask, how does this relate to the previous, uh, how does it relate to verse 19? Then perhaps we look, go back and look at verse 19, and we see maybe some other thing in which they have in common, not just the question, what makes it go? But in each case, you see an eagle in the sky and a serpent, not just a serpent in the the sand, but a serpent on a rock, Uh, the way of a ship in the middle of the sea, the way of a man with a maid. You look at each one of those, and when it does its thing, you know, an eagle in the sky doesn't leave like a trail behind it. A serpent, if it's on sand, it will leave a path, it will leave tracks, but not on a rock. A ship in the middle of the sea, you know, there's no, like, hole in the sea, footpaths foot in the sea. Uh, yes, if you have a speedboat, you can get awake and things like that, but don't, don't think that. This, we're, we're remembering uh, the kinds of ship, the ships they had back then. And the way of a man with a maid, you see, when you first see a man and a maid coming together, and a, a man and a woman, um, but notice in verse 20, she is described or a woman is described, I think it's, you're supposed to put these together, an adulterous woman, where they come together and, nope, doesn't look like, you know, that anything has happened. There's no, there's no immediate trail. Now, nine months later, there might be, <laughs> but there's no immediate sign that anything has happened. And she eats and wipes her mouth and says, I have done no wrong. Remember the the um, the arrogant person in the previous proverb that that dishonored father and mother and says I've done no wrong. Um, there's a denial of something going on. Next we have verse twenty one. Under three things the earth quakes, and under four, it cannot bear up. And remember we're going to look at, at the fourth one. So let's look at these three and then four things. Under a slave when he becomes king. Now, slaves don't normally know how to be king, but when he becomes king, watch out, something's going to change. It might be good, it might be bad, but it won't be dull. And a fool, when he is satisfied with food, (laughs) okay. Uh, Verse 23, under an unloved woman, when she gets a husband, (laughs) again, things change in a hurry there. And then finally, and here's, here's the one that you're supposed to call your attention to, a maidservant, when she surplants her mistress. That actually reminds me of the slave when he becomes king, a bit. Uh, In other words, somebody leaving their social status and going to not just a higher status, but then supplanting somebody uh, on the way up. Uh, And so uh, when those things sort sort of happen, watch out, things are going to change in a big way. So that's the thing I think that they, they have in common. Uh, There's an overpoweringness to, to what takes place. Next, we have verse 24. Four things are small on the earth. Now, we, I don't have three and then four, so we're not going to, to maybe really focus on the last one. Uh, we're just going to see all four. <coughs> four are small on the earth, but they are exceedingly wise. Uh, so they're small, 
but they're wise, and here they are. Uh, in other words, they're industrious. They get things done. Verse 25, the ants are not a strong people, but they prepare their food in the summer. Uh, the Shephanim, and uh, it's like, what, who and what are Shephanim? Known as it's plural, are not a mighty people, yet they make their houses in the rocks. Our translators weren't, weren't sure how to translate that, so they just left the Hebrew there. Uh, I guess that's okay. Uh, perhaps badgers, uh, but that's, notice I put a question mark, we're just not sure. Uh, verse 27, the locusts have no king, yet all of them go out in ranks. And let me just say, when a locust plague comes, comes on the scene, uh, it's just, uh, it seems... Uh, to just be compelling, like an army that has m- marched in. And then vi- finally, verse 28, the lizard you may grasp with the hands, yet it is in king's palaces. Uh, so here are small things, and, and that's the point. Uh, size isn't everything. Uh, sometimes small things can accomplish a lot. Um, watch out for small beginnings, both good and bad. And so you can take this proverb a variety of ways. Verse 29, there are three things which are stately in their march, even four, which are stately when they walk. And so because it's three, then four, we're going to be on the lookout for the last one in particular. First of all, the lion, which is mighty among beasts and does not retreat before any. The strutting rooster, the male goat also, that's our first three. And here's, here's where, where our attention is really be drawn. And a king when his army is with him. <clears throat> Notice, it's not, it's not just a king. It's not just a king on his throne, but it's king when his army is with him, when he's backed up with that, with that hand of authority, uh, not just because he has authority, but because he's got the army there. (laughs) Uh, uh, He's empowered. So watch out for empowered people. Verse 32, if you have been foolish in exalting yourself, um, and so here's the situation, if you've been foolish in exalting yourself, or if you have plotted evil, that's, that's the situation, uh, but notice what we're told to do if you're in that situation. Put your hand on your mouth. In other words, stop now. Uh, if you've been foolish and exalting yourself, that wasn't very smart. Uh, if you've plotted, and the evil is the idea behind that, and I think the uh, translators were right to include that term evil, even though it's italicized. Um, so that's the situation. Verse 33, for the churning of milk produces butter, and pressing the nose brings forth blood. So the churning of anger produces strife. Now, in each one of these, there is a cause and effect. You churn milk and, and you get butter. You press your nose, you know, squeeze your nose really hard until it you know, begins to bleed. And it bleeds. Uh, the churning of anger. And so the first three uh, are, or the first two are just sort of physical things. But now the, the last one is really what it's all about. The churning of anger produces strife. Um, and if you've been doing that sort of thing, you know, uh, it, stop those foolish actions. Stop and stop immediately. Don't wait. Don't pass go. Don't collect $200. Stop immediately. And that's true of all of these Proverbs. If there's something that's being pointed, pointed out that you've been doing wrong, don't hesitate. <laughs> stop that <laughs> and stop it now.